Hey Cafe Crew, it's Colin Smith here from PhotoshopCafe.com. This year is the year of the multiple lens smartphone camera and today we're going to have a look at the photographic capabilities of the two top contenders. We're going to have a look at the iPhone 11 Pro and we're going to have a look at the Google Pixel 4. <laughs> So you've probably seen reviews before, especially the iPhone 11. I didn't bother posting an iPhone 11 review because there were so many of them out there. But this is going to be different because we're going to go in depth into the photographic features and the computational photography inside of both of these from a photographer's point of view. So we're going to do real world tests, which I've already ran, and I'm going to walk you through those and show you what to look for, um, for things like dynamic range and different things like that that really matter in photography. So why don't we get started with the two cameras. So the first of all, we have the iPhone 11 Pro. And of course I have this in the new green color. I'm not sure I understand. Um, we'll get to that later, Siri. <laughs> And also you'll notice the three lenses, which everybody knows about. Okay, then we're going to have a look at the Google Pixel 4. So why don't we pipe up in this nice package. Now, full disclosure, this was sent to me by Google. So it's a gift by Google. However, this is a completely unbiased review. There's no obligation for me to do a review. And there's no instructions or anything like that saying I have to give this a favorable review. I'm not being paid. This is not a sponsored video. So let's continue. So let's pop this open. And... All right, so here we are. We have the also oh orange Google Pixel 4. So first of all, just a very quick look at these phones. Now, I might just start calling them cameras because that's essentially what I'm reviewing here. Okay, so I have the iPhone 11 Pro in midnight green, and I have the Google Pixel 4 XL in the also oh orange. So these are the uh, brand new colors in both of these. And if we look on the front, you'll notice that both of them have an array of cameras. The iPhone 11 has three cameras. It has a wide, it has a zoom, and it has an ultra wide. So it has the three lenses and the flash. On the Pixel, there's only two lenses. There's a wide and a zoom lens. Of course, there's the flash, and then there's also the sensor, the laser sensor. Both of them have a flat finish on the back. They're seamless all the way around. And of course, we have the glass front. On the iPhone, we have the infamous notch is still there on the 11. On the Pixel, we don't have a notch. Instead, we have this uh, kind of wider bar at the top and a thinner bar at the bottom. Now, inside this bar here, there's a lot of different technology. There's a forward-facing camera, of course, but then there's a laser, and then there's also a new radar in there. So when you have this off, both of these use Face ID. Now, the Google Pixel, uses the radar to sense when you're getting closer and then it starts to prepare it for the face ID. And then when you put up to your face, it turns on. And I have noticed that the face ID is pretty fast. All right, to get to the camera here, we just double click and that will bring us to the camera. To go to the camera on the iPhone, on the lock screen, we can just click the camera. To flip it around, just tap on the, the button there. If we're on the pixel, just twist it like that and it will go to the front facing back facing, so that's how you kind of flip it around very quickly. Now, if you want to zoom, of course, you already know this on the iPhone. Let me just flip it around. To zoom, we can tap or tap to get the three different lenses. Okay, so we can tap and hold, and that way we can zoom in or out. Of course, you can also pinch in and out to zoom. With the pixel, Tap, double tap, and that will go to the two times camera. Double tap, it'll go back. You can slide this for zoom, or you can pinch, of course, to zoom in and out. All right, so that's the basic functionality of these two phones. A couple of other things to bear in mind. Neither of them have fingerprint ID anymore. Both of them use that face ID. There's no headphone jack on either of these. The Pixel uses USB-C. The iPhone uses the Lightning still, which is, I believe, one of the last things in the Apple line still using Lightning. All right, let's talk about the photography and have a look. So the first thing I wanted to test was just to take it out and just walk around in the evening in a well-lit situation and just take a photograph. So if we do, we can have a look at these photos and you can see the photos are pretty good. 
Um, you can tell there's a little bit of a slower shutter speed on the iPhone because of the movement on the water. But if you look at the colors I, on the Pixel, I think are a little bit more natural and also the lights behind, you can see a little bit of bokeh there. But overall, both of these are very good. Let's look at another photograph where we're looking at depth of field. Now, let me talk about depth of field for a second. The depth of field is the amount of area that's in focus when you take the photograph. A wide depth of field or an endless depth of field, everything would be in focus. A shallow depth of field where there's a very, very narrow focal plane. And if that no focal plane was very, very narrow like that, and you take a photograph, your nose could be sharp, the rest of your face could be out of focus. And this is what creates the bokeh effect. The bokeh is in the background where things fall out of focus, and there's lights. And you see these beautiful little round discs of out of focus lights behind it, and we call that bokeh or bokeh, depending on how you want to pronounce it. But this is also synonymous with nice portrait or high-end photography because people are used to the subject being in focus and the background being soft and blurry. Now, this is something that we only really did before with DSLR or expensive cameras with detachable lenses with wider or larger apertures. Because the wider you open the aperture, the more it opens up, the shallower the depth of field, the more the background falls out of focus. The smaller the closing or the smaller the aperture, then it would be a wider depth of field and everything is in focus. So traditionally, this is a problem with these phones because they have very, very small lenses. So what's happened is both of these are now using uh, computational photography and AI in order to do this. What do I mean by all of that? Well, what I mean is that when you use these, what they do, they use both lenses to sample the object. Now, both of these have inbuilt AI um, that Android now has AI on board here. And what they do is they look at the shape and they know it's a person, a dog, a cat, a car, whatever it may be, a mug. And then it once it understands what that object is, then it tries to mask the object. So it creates what's known as a depth map. And a depth map is basically it creates the shape inside the phone and then paints it. White would come further forward, black would go further back and it creates this depth map to kind of understand where it is in space. And then it uses that to create a depth of field effect. So in other words, if it sees me and it recognizes a person, it's going to mask me out just like you would in Photoshop and enter the background out of focus. Now, this is portrait mode. Both of these use the same technology in that portrait mode. OK, let's have a look and see how well it's doing it. We're taking a picture of this path here. This is a metal, just a metal grate with lights underneath. And you can see the little dots in the background. In fact, why don't we look at a zoomed in one and we can see the bokeh. Now this bokeh is not really created with the lens. This is actually done in post-production. So the phone actually looks at the photograph and then recognizes those areas of lights and applies that bokeh or bokeh effect. And so we can see both of these do it very nicely. And one of the things you want to look for is how evenly and naturally it starts to blend off into the distance and throw it out of focus. In fact, both of these look amazing, you know, to the point that people would think that we use a DSLR. And so the question is, are these cameras good enough that we don't need DSLRs anymore? Or will they be one day? Let me know in the comments underneath. I'm really curious what you think about that. Let's move on a little bit more. Let's look at some close-up stuff where we really get into this depth of field effect. So right now, I'm in the sushi bar and I'm taking photos of the sushi. On the left, we've got the iPhone. On the right, we've got the Pixel. Both of these look really good. However, there's some things to bear in mind. Look at the background here. We've got a little bit of out of focus here and also on the glass. It's looking pretty good. We've got some good details in the sushi. Everything, I mean, this is a good quality photograph. When we look at the Pixel 4, this is also a good quality photograph, although I see a little bit more um, natural color here. And by the way, all the photos I'm showing are straight out of camera. I haven't retouched any of these or applied any adjustments. A little bit more contrast in there, a little bit more natural color. Um, but also look at the background. See how my glass is there? See how the you know, we've got the depth of field there, we've got the blur in the background, and even on that counter surface. It's very, very natural, and very realistic looking. Okay, moving on. Now I'm taking a picture of a sushi roll. And one of the things I want to do is I want to test this depth of field. Can I focus up close and let it fall out of focus or focus far away on that object 
and let it be blurry in the front. Just like, you know, when you're taking a photograph of a row of people and you got the camera and you're trying to focus, where do you focus, right? Let's have a look and see how this is doing. So here's the photographs from both of them. And as you can see, both of these are great photos. However, I tapped on the very front of the sushi here. So as we can see, we've got the iPhone. It didn't quite get the front. It was kind of around the middle there. Um, whereas the pixels are able to focus directly on the front. Up close, I've changed the one on the iPhone a little bit so we can see the sharpest or the most in focus part to compare with the Pixel 4 so we can look at the focus. And as you can see, both of these are very sharp and this is up close. This is incredible for a mobile phone. All right, so let's have a look at the test that I wanted to do for taking the sushi, making the front of this roll in focus and sharp, and then take another photo where the back of the roll is sharp. So here's the first one where the front is very sharp. Look at that. Background, everything is soft, blurry, and you can see how it slowly falls out of focus, just like a real uh, DSLR camera. Then we focus on the back. Notice the background is a little bit sharper, and the front is soft and blurry. Then we try for the iPhone, and not so much luck. Uh, this is trying to focus forward and backwards. Mm, not so much. So I'm starting to see some things where the Google Pixel 4 is definitely starting to edge out the iPhone 11 Pro. Let's look a little bit more closely at that computational photography, in other words, creating that mask, and let's see how good that is. So here's a glass, I took a photo. On the left-hand side, you can see that the straw started to fall out of focus, and it kind of got confused and thought that was part of the background as well as the top of the glass. The Pixel 4, on the other hand, look at that beautiful clean mask, you got the entire glass and the straw, not just that, but also this uh, mid-ground object, saw that. Through the background out, we can see some nice bokeh colors there. And also, once again, the color is more natural on a pixel, which is something I'm seeing. All right, so here's the thing with this straw kind of being lost. It's a problem I found. Whenever there's an area of stark contrast with the iPhone, it can struggle a little bit to understand what's the foreground and what's the background. Maybe because Google have a lot more <laughs> images to pull from um, because, you know, that's kind of Google's area, right? You know, search and they have a lot of um, AI that have been doing a lot longer than Apple. So looking at it here, we can see there's a knife here. Notice how the handle, it thinks it's part of the background. That's soft and blurry, whereas the actual blade is sharp. Okay, so let's move on and look at a different area here. Here we are just outside is an illuminated store, took a photograph with both phones. I think both photographs are very good. Once again, color I think is a little bit more natural on the Pixel. However, I think the iPhone did a better job of grabbing the sign here. It looks a little sharper. And I think part of that too is because it's kind of turning this out of focus and it's going for that kind of depth of field. Um, both of them though, there's no problems there. The HDR is working very well, and I'll explain that in a second. So we can even see the screen and the background. We notice that that is um, not blowing out. So none of the highlights are being lost. All that details there, uh, very, very nice. We've got all these lights. In a lit situation, it would be difficult to, you know, not blow out those highlights. And nothing's blowing out, looking very good. Okay, let's look at a night shot. So there's a tree there, uh, and it was there, it's not lit yet, they're building it early because they're going to do this ice skating ring around it. So it's in the dark, and I wanted to take a picture of that with both of these. So when you're looking at it, it's pretty much almost a silhouette of a tree. So if we look at this tree here, the night mode on the left of the iPhone looks great. We've got uh, lots of detail here. Uh, the colors are showing, and, and it looks good. The Google Pixel 4 with the uh, night shot also looking great. Both of these are very good shots. Let's look at them close up. I think the colors, once again, a little bit more natural on a pixel. Um, but, you know, there's no problems with either of these. And the color being off is something that can be adjusted so easily. Um, so we're looking at this. You know, we've got great detail in both of these phones. Very, very good. So that night mode is working good. So at this point, I think both of these phones are going to be good. Okay, so let's kind of look at this one. Digital zoom has been somewhat of a unicorn in photography. Like, digital zoom's been around a long time. Photographer's advice is usually turn it off. So the difference between optical and digital zoom is optical zoom is using the lens. Digital zoom, typically what it's doing is it's enlarging inside the sensor and cropping it off to make it look like 
it's closer, which is essentially what it's doing. And it's also a process called interpolation. So when you resize inside of Photoshop, it's using interpolation or essentially rebuilding those images. Now, traditionally, Photoshop has always done a much better job than a camera. So people say, you know, don't use digital zoom because you're better off go into Photoshop, you know, increase the size of it, crop it down, and that will get you a better result than digital zoom. We used to also say that about autofocus and video. No one would use autofocus and video, but now it's a standard. I think this might be about to change where digital zoom might actually be a thing now. And trust me, this is a big deal in photography. If you, know, if you don't understand, this could mean that we don't have to carry around huge lenses for the rest of our lives. There's a lot of implications of this, but first of all, let's see if it matches up to its promise. So what makes this any different in scaling and cropping, which is essentially digital zoom? Well, computational photography, what it does is it takes multiple photographs then what it does is it analyzes the data in all of those photos and it uses artificial intelligence to rebuild one photograph, eliminating the noise, the artifacts, and creating the sharpest possible image. Now, Google have been doing this for a while. The Pixel 3 and the 3a have been doing this. That's why they only had one lens and you could zoom. And, you know, it, it was for all essential purposes, very good. But the one thing it didn't have is binocular vision, meaning it couldn't create a three-dimensional point cloud. When you have more than one object, you get stereoscopic vision, meaning you can use both lenses to kind of see around a little bit, analyze a little bit more data, and produce a better result, because now you've got two sources rather than one to pull from. <laughs> what, essentially what it means is they take a bunch of photos, stitch them together, and create one good photo. Well, how well does that work? Let's have a look. So I just went out in the street, took a photograph and you can see some houses here. Normal photo, looks great. Then we use the optical zoom, which is the zoom lens. And I could see on the iPhone 11, it was a little bit sharper. That's that you can decide what you prefer, but I think either of these is a very good zoom. So optically, both of these cameras are working very well. All right, let's have a look when we go to zoom in further. All right, so now what I'm doing is I am pinching to zoom. I'm zoomed all the way in so we'll well past the optics of either of these cameras. And then when we look at this, look on the left here, it's sharp, but it's also introducing some artifacts. So the iPhone 11, it doesn't look like it's using the computational photography as well. In fact, I'm wondering if it even is. So, so there was a technology that Apple announced during the keynote called Deep Fusion. So Deep Fusion is essentially doing what Google has been doing, and that's taking multiple photos using the inbuilt AI, putting them together and creating one photo. That is not in the camera yet. And so I, I can understand maybe this is why the zoom is not looking so good. So once this actually gets pushed out and it'll be pushed out as an update into the iPhone pretty soon, I expect to see a much improved result on what it's getting here. Now I've seen some people look at deep fusion, they just look at normal photos. I don't think you can really tell much of a difference. If you wanna see a difference, go into a digital zoom somewhere where the um, deep fusion has to um, you know, use a computations to create a new photo. That's, I think, where we would see the difference. Is it going to do that or isn't it? I'm not really sure. We'll see when it comes out. So for now, we look at this. You know, we've got some artifacts. Look at things on here. Um, you know, the sign here is much sharper, but this one is much cleaner. And look at the detail here on the tile roof. In fact, why don't we zoom in and have a look? So here we go. This is the iPhone photograph. See, it's not really usable. Pixelization, artifacts, it looks like a, you know an image that's been scaled up or zoomed in too far in Photoshop. I don't think that's something that we could really use. On the Pixel, it's looking pretty good. In fact, it's almost looking like a lens to me. So as good as this was in the 3 and the 3A, the 4, it is definitely improved a lot and this is quite impressive. I'm super impressed with this. So, you know, for things like concerts and different things like that, you know, where you're back and you want to zoom in, I feel like maybe now I can get some good quality shots. Let's look at another example. So let's look at the tree. So we can see we've got a palm tree here. Look at this. It's very stringy looking. Uh, the colors are sucked out of it and, you know, just not good on the iPhone here. On the right, we can see the Pixel 4. We've got good colors. It looks smooth. Once again, up close, compare them at 100% view iPhone, just no, not usable. Pixel 4, very nice. 
Okay, let's jump in right now and let's have a look at the unique features of some of these phones. Now, before I do, one of the things I do want to mention is both of these use Smart HDR or HDR. So that means, what is HDR? So basically, in a nutshell, HDR is being able to see the lightest and darkest parts of the photo at the same time. Now, the human eye can see deep shadows and pretty light lights at the same time because you know, well, for one, the pupils expanding and dilating and also, you know, to adjust for the light and the changes in light. Whereas a camera, you know, if you focus an area, you know, which is really, really bright, such as a sunset, if you get that sunset, you know, where it's not blowing out and you're actually capturing the color, then the shadow areas are just pitch black because it doesn't have enough dynamic range to simultaneously capture the, you know, the sun rays and the foreground. On the other hand, if you expose for the foreground, you can get that nicely properly exposed, but the sunset is just going to be a white blown out blob with no detail in the highlights. So HDR is essentially taking multiple photos where you're bracketing the photos. You're taking a photo for the brightest part, for the medium part, and for the shadow part, and then merge them together, a process called tone mapping, put them together in one photograph, and now you have an HDR photo. So I have a ton of tutorials where I go much more in depth and show you how to do HDR here on Photoshop Cafe. Check those out. So both of these use HDR. So the nice thing about it is, you know, blowing out areas, you know, when we're, you know, in mixed lighting, you know, where there's shadows and highlights in the same photo, blowing out those highlights is really becoming a thing of the past. Both of these are capturing that detail and we're getting some tremendous photographs. Now, one of the things that is unique though, with the HDR inside of the pixel is when you're taking a photograph, you've got double exposure controls. Okay, so I've got two sliders here. The first one here is for the highlights. So I can adjust this so I can see all my highlights nicely. None of the highlights are blown out now and the shadows are very dark. So now I'm gonna grab the shadow slider and I can brighten that one up. And so I can use both of these sliders together to independently set exposure for the shadows and highlights. So obviously the more the shadows and highlights are showing together, the higher the dynamic range. The nice thing about this phone is it has a real time preview where I can actually see on screen because it's an HDR screen, so is the iPhone, but I can see on the HDR screen exactly what the photograph is going to look like before I take it. So that's really cool. And you can see this example here you know, where I just set the exposure for the highlights, but then I also set the exposure for the shadows here, opened them up and took a better photograph. Both of these are straight out of camera, no post-production. So because of the three lenses or the three cameras on the back of the iPhone 11 Pro, it does have an edge over the Pixel 4 in the area of composition because it has the wide angle and the zoom, just like we have in a Pixel, but this also has the ultra wide angle lens, which goes to the equivalent of 13 millimeters. So you can do a really wide photo, which is great for things like landscape, architectural photos, where you can fit a lot more in the scene so you can see more. And also it's fun when you get up close on people, you can get that cool kind of fisheye effect. And so there's a little bit more you can do with that. I'm kind of a little bit disappointed that this doesn't have it in there. So the next thing has been a lot of buzz on the Pixel 4, and that's about astrophotography. So the night sight is incredibly good, and in fact, it's so good that they claim you can shoot the stars with it. So once you're in night sight mode, and it detects that the camera is not moving, so you're either using a tripod or leaning it up against something, you will see the option for astrophotography. So in astrophotography, this will take 15 exposures up to 16 seconds each. And this can go up to four minutes to take that photograph. So what it does is it keeps capturing those different photos and then it blends them together into one photo. Now you can take a photograph on a camera, you know, for a minute, minute and a half, two minutes, three minutes, but the stars start to move. So you get the star trails. Whereas this one taking shorter photographs, you don't get the movement and it can actually build it together and get some really nice Milky Way shots and um, you know, and stars, star field. So here's the clincher though, when you wanna do this or any kind of astrophotography, you can't really do it in the city. What you need to do is you need to get out of the city, drive out to an area which is very dark, so you've got no light pollution, and also you know all the haze and stuff that comes from the city. You want a nice clear sky, you know, like when you go to the desert or to the mountains, or you go out to that place where you can just see this beautiful clear sky. So unfortunately, because of the time I had, I wasn't able to drive out into the desert 
and and do that. I will do that later. But for now, what I did is I just drove to a parking lot, which was somewhat dark, set up the camera and took some pictures. Now, you know, there's no Milky Way or anything there. But as you can see, you know, it did capture the stars. So, you know, there's examples online of much better astrophotography than that. So one of the things that's really amazing on the Pixel 4 here is the 90 hertz refresh rate. It's on both the 4 and the 4XL. What does that mean? It means that this screen runs at a really, really high frame rate, which means in games and different things like that, it's, it's almost soap opera type movement. It's so smooth. And trust me, it really is noticeable how smooth the movement is on this particular screen. Very impressive. And one of the things too is it doesn't always run at 90. It's a variable. So, you know, it has a variable frame rate. I don't know if that's a term, but it sounds like it should be a term. So essentially what it does is it uses the radar and it's always watching you. I know that sounds creepy. We'll talk about that in a second. But um, what it does is it knows when you're looking away or it knows when you're not at the phone and then it will use a low refresh rate. When you're engaged in the phone and looking at it, then it's going to pump up the refresh rate. And so it's basically not wasting power while you're not looking at it. You know, kind of like the sound of one hand clapping in your, or, you know, when a tree falls and there's no one there, kind of like that. Talk about privacy. So, you know, Apple prides itself on pri privacy. Uh, you know, when you do the fingerprint ID and the face ID, it says, you know what, nothing is sent to anybody. It stays on your phone. When you erase your phone, it's gone, you know, because the AI Bionic chip is built onto the phone. So thinking, okay, thumb ID for Google's good, you know, face ID, do I want to give Google my, 3D print of my face or 3D map of the face. Well, so Google states that all of this stays on the phone. So the AI is actually built on this phone now. And so it doesn't transmit or send your face ID information at all. It stays locked on the phone here. So, so that's really good news. So anyway, that's the, you know, the camera tests here, you know, check out on the website, photoshopcafe.com. I'll put a link underneath where you can actually have a look at those photographs and you can see and compare them yourself. Um, I'm curious, what do you guys think? Are you even ready for a new phone? Do you think, number one, will the cameras on these replace real cameras for lack of a better term? Or are they real cameras now? And the other thing is, you know, are you going to buy a new phone? Would you buy a phone just for the camera? And if you do, which one would you get? Really curious, let me know in the comments underneath. And if you like these kind of reviews where we go a little bit more in depth into the areas of digital imaging, then consider subscribing to Photoshop Cafe. So I do a new video every single week, typically uploading on a Tuesday. So ring the notification bell so you know when I upload a new video. If you like this, smash the like button into dust. And until next time, I'll see you at the cafe a shot right now so I can do the um, you know, thumbnail photo and turn it around that way this way look shocked look disgusted look surprised